Tybel and her demon. In the town of Lashnik, not far from Lublin, there lived a man and his wife. His name was Chaim Nussen, hers Tybel. They had no children. Not that the marriage was barren. Tybel had borne her husband a son and two daughters, but all three had died in infancy, one of whooping cough one of scarlet fever, and one of diphtheria. After that, Tybele's womb closed up, and nothing availed, neither prayers, nor spells, nor potions. Grief drove Chaim Nussen to withdraw from the world. He kept apart from his wife, stopped eating meat, and no longer slept at home, but on a bench in the prayer house. Taibele owned a dry goods store, inherited from her parents, and she sat there all day with a yardstick on her right, a pair of shears on her left, and the women's prayer book in Yiddish in front of her. Chaim Nussen, tall, lean, with black eyes and a wedge of a beard, had always been a morose, silent man, even at the best of times. Taibele was small and fair, with blue eyes and a round face. Although punished by the Almighty, she still smiled easily, the dimples playing on her cheeks. She had no one else to cook for now, but she lit the stove or the tripod every day and cooked some porridge or soup for herself. She also went on with her knitting, now a pair of stockings, now a vest, or else she would embroider something on canvas. It wasn't in her nature to rail at fate or cling to sorrow. One day, Chaim Nussen put his prayer shawl and phylacteries, a change of underwear and a loaf of bread into a sack and left the house. Neighbours asked where he was going. He answered, wherever my eyes lead me. When people told Taibele that her husband had left her, it was too late to catch up with him. He was already across the river. It was discovered that he had hired a cart to take him to Lublin. Taibele sent a messenger to seek him out, but neither her husband nor the messenger was ever seen again. At 33, Taibele found herself a deserted wife. After a period of searching, she realised that she had nothing more to hope for. God had taken both her children and her husband. She would never be able to marry again. From now on, she would have to live alone. All she had left was her house, her store, and her belongings. The townspeople pitied her, for she was a quiet woman, kind-hearted and honest in her business dealings. Everyone asked, how did she deserve such misfortunes? But God's ways are hidden from man. Taibele had several friends among the town matrons whom she had known since childhood. In the daytime, housewives are busy with their pots and pans, but in the evening, Taibele's friends often dropped in for a chat. In the summer, they would sit on a bench outside the house, gossiping and 
telling each other stories. One moonless summer evening when the town was as dark as Egypt, Tybele sat with her friends on the bench, telling them a tale she had read in a book brought from a peddler. It was about a, a young Jewish woman and a demon who had ravished her and lived with her as man and wife. Tybele recounted the story in all its details. The women huddled closer together, joined hands, spat to ward off evil, and laughed the kind of laughter that comes from fear. One of them asked, Why didn't she exorcise him with an amulet? Not every demon is frightened of amulets, answered Taibele. Why didn't she make a journey to a holy rabbi? The demon warned her that he would choke her if she revealed the secret. Woe is me, Fezmir. May the Lord protect us. May no one know of such things, a woman cried out. I'll be afraid to go home now, the third one said. I'll walk with you, said another. While they were talking, Alchonen, the teacher's helper, who hoped one day to become a badchen, a wedding jester, happened to be passing by. Alchonen, five years a widower, had the reputation of being a wag and a prankster, a man with a screw loose. His steps were silent, because the soles of his shoes were worn through and he walked on his bare feet. When he heard Taibele telling the story, he halted to listen. The darkness was so thick and the women so engrossed in the weird tale that they did not see him. This Alchonen was a dissipated fellow, full of cunning, goatish tricks. On the instant, he formed a mischievous plan. After the women had gone, Alchonen stole into Taibele's yard. He hid behind a tree and watched through the window. When he saw Taibele go to bed and put out the candle, he slipped into the house. Taibele had not bolted the door. Thieves were unheard of in that town. In the hallway, he took off his shabby kaftan, his fringed garment, his trousers, and stood as naked as his mother bore him. Then he tiptoed to Taibele's bed. She was almost asleep, when suddenly she saw a figure looming in the dark. She was too terrified to utter a sound. Who is it? She whispered, trembling. Alchonen replied in a hollow voice, Don't scream, Taibele. If you cry out, I will destroy you. I am the demon Hormitz, ruler over darkness, rain, hail, thunder, and wild beasts. I am the evil spirit who espoused the young woman you spoke about tonight. And because you told the story with such relish, I heard your words from the abyss and was filled with lust for your body. Do not try to resist, for I drag away those who refuse to do my will beyond the mountains of darkness to Mount Seir, into a wilderness where man's foot is unknown, where no beast dares to tread, where the earth is of iron and the sky of copper. And I roll them in thorns and in fire, among adders and scorpions, until every bone of their body is ground to dust, and they are lost for eternity in the nether depths. But if 
you comply with my wish, not a hair of your head will be harmed, and I will send you success in every undertaking. Hearing these words, Taibele lay motionless as in a swoon. Her heart fluttered and seemed to stop. She thought her end had come. After a while, she gathered courage and murmured, What do you want of me? I'm a married woman. Your husband is dead. I followed in his funeral procession myself. The voice of the teacher's helper boomed out. It is true that I cannot go to the rabbi to testify and free you to remarry, for the rabbis don't believe our kind. Besides, I don't dare step across the threshold of the rabbi's chamber. I fear the holy scrolls. But I'm not lying. Your husband died in an epidemic, and the worms have already gnawed away his nose. And even were he alive, you would not be forbidden to lie with me, for the laws of the Shulchan Oirech do not apply to us. Hormitzer, the teacher's helper, went on with his persuasions, some sweet, some threatening. He invoked the names of angels and devils, of demonic beasts and of vampires. He swore that Asmodeus, king of the demons, was his step-uncle. He said that Lilith, queen of the evil spirits, danced for him on one foot and did every manner of thing to please him. Shivtach, the she-devil who stole babies from women in childhood, baked poppy seed cakes for him in hell's ovens and leavened them with the fat of wizards and black dogs. He argued so long, adducing such witty parables and proverbs, that Taibele was finally obliged to smile in her extremity. Hormitzer vowed that he had loved Taibele for a long time. He described to her the dresses and shawls she had worn that year, and the year before. He told her the secret thoughts that came to her as she needed dough, prepared her Sabbath meal, washed herself in the bath, and saw to her needs at the outhouse. He also reminded her of the morning when she had wakened with a black and blue mark on her breast. She had thought it was the pinch of a ghoul but it was really the mark left by a kiss of Hormitz's lips, he said. After a while, the demon got into Tybele's bed and had his will of her. He told her that from then on he would visit her twice a week on Wednesdays and on Sabbath evenings, for those were the nights when the unholy ones were abroad in the world. He warned her, though, not to divulge to anyone what had befallen her, or even hint at it, on pain of dire punishment. He would pluck out the hair from her skull, pierce her eyes, and bite out her navel. He would cast her into a desolate wilderness where bread was dung and water was blood and where the wailing of Tsalmovis was heard all day and all night. He commanded Taibele to swear by the bones of her mother that she would keep the secret to her last day. Taibele saw that there was no escape for her. She put her hand on his thigh and swore an oath and did all that the monster bade her. Before Hormitsa left, he kissed her long and lustfully, and since he was a demon and not a man, Taibele returned his kisses, 
and moistened his beard with her tears. Evil spirit though he was, he had treated her kindly. When Hormitsu was gone, Taibade sobbed into her pillow until sunrise. Hormitsu came every Wednesday night and every Sabbath night. Taibale was afraid that she might find herself with child and give birth to some monster with tail and horns, an imp or a moon calf. But Hormitsu promised to protect her against shame. Taibale asked whether she need go to the ritual bath to cleanse herself after her impure days. But Hormitsu said that the laws concerning menstruation did not extend to those who consorted with the unclean host. As the saying goes, may God preserve us from all that we can get accustomed to. And so it was with Taibele. In the beginning, she had feared that her nocturnal visitant might do her harm, give her boils or elf locks, make her bark like a dog or drink urine, and bring disgrace upon her. But Hormitsa did not whip her or pinch her or spit on her. On the contrary, he caressed her, whispered endearments, made puns and rhymes for her. Sometimes he pulled such pranks and babbled such devil's nonsense that she was forced to laugh. He tugged at the lobe of her ear and gave her love bites on the shoulder. And in the morning, she found the marks of his teeth on her skin. He persuaded her to let her hair grow under her cap, and he wove it into braids. He taught her charms and spells, told her about his night brethren, the demons with whom he flew over ruins and fields of toadstools, over the salt marshes of Sidon and the frozen wastes of the Sea of Ice. He did not deny that he had other wives, but they were all she-devils. Taibele was the only human wife he possessed. When Taibele asked him the names of his wives, he enumerated them. Nama, Machlat, Af, Hulde, Zluche, Nafke and Cheme. Seven altogether. He told her that Nama was black as pitch and full of rage. When she quarrelled with him, she spat venom and blew fire and smoke through her nostrils. Machlat had the face of a leech, and those whom she touched with her tongue were forever branded. Af loved to adorn herself with silver, emeralds, and diamonds. Her braids were of spun gold. On her ankles she wore bells and bracelets. When she danced, all the deserts rang out with their chiming. Hulde had the shape of a cat. She meowed instead of speaking. Her eyes were green as gooseberries. When she copulated, she always chewed bear's liver. Zluche was the enemy of brides. She robbed bridegrooms of potency. If a bride stepped outside alone at night during the seven nuptial benedictions, Zluche danced up to her and the bride lost the power of speech or was taken by a seizure. Nafke was lecherous always betraying him with other demons. She retained his affections only by her vile and insolent talk, which delighted his heart. Chema should have, according to her name, been as vicious as Nama should have been mild. But the reverse was true. Chema was a she-devil without gall. She was forever doing charitable deeds kneading dough for housewives when they were ill, or bringing bread to the homes of the poor. Thus, Hormitzer described his wives 
and told Taibele how he disported himself with them, playing tag over roofs and engaging in all sorts of pranks. Ordinarily, a woman is jealous when a man consorts with other women, but how can a human be jealous of a female devil? Quite the contrary. Rumitz's tales amused Taibele, and she was always plying him with questions. Sometimes he revealed to her mysteries no mortal may know about God, his angels and seraphs, his heavenly mansions and the seven heavens. He also told her how sinners, male and female, were tortured in barrels of pitch and cauldrons of fiery coals, on beds studded with nails, and in pits of snow, and how the black angels beat the bodies of sinners with rods of fire. The greatest punishment in hell was tickling, Hormitzer said. There was a certain imp in hell by the name of Lekish. When Lekish tickled an adulteress on her soles or under the, her arms, her tormented laughter echoed all the way to the island of Madagascar. In this way, Hormitsa entertained Taibere all through the night, and soon it came about that she began to miss him when he was away. The summer nights seemed too short, for Hormitsa would leave soon after cockcrow. Even winter nights were not long enough, the truth was that she now loved Hormitze, and though she knew a woman must not lust after a demon, she longed for him day and night. Although Alhonen had been a widower for many years, matchmakers still tried to marry him off. The girls they proposed were from mean homes, widows and divorcees, for a teacher's helper was a poor provider, and Alchonen had besides the reputation of being a shiftless ne'er-do-well. Alchonen dismissed the offers on various pretexts. One woman was too ugly, the other had a foul tongue, the third was a, a slattern. The matchmakers wondered, how could a teacher's helper, who earned nine groschen a week, presume to be such a picker and chooser? And how long could a man live alone? But no one can be dragged by force to the chuppe, to the wedding canopy. Alchonen knocked around town, long, lean, tattered, with a red, dishevelled beard, in a crumpled shirt with his pointed Adam's apple jumping up and down. He waited for the wedding jester, Reb Zekele, to die, so that he could take over his job. But Reb Zekele was in no hurry to die. He still enlivened weddings with an inexhaustible flow of quips and rhymes, as in his younger days. Alchonen tried to set up on his own as a teacher for beginners, but no householder would entrust his child to him. Mornings and evenings he took the boys to and from the cheder. During the day he sat in Reb Itchile, the teacher's courtyard, idly whittling wooden pointers or cutting out pa paper decorations which were used only once a year at Pentecost or modelling figurines from clay. Not far from Taibele's store there was a well and Alchonen came there many times a day to draw a pail of water or to take a drink, spilling the water over his red beard. At these times he would throw a quick glance at Taibele. Taibele pitied him. Why was the man knocking about all by himself? And Alchonen would say to himself each time, Woe, Taibele, if you knew the truth, Alchonen lived in a garret in the house of an old widow who was deaf and half-blind. The crone often chided him for not going to the synagogue to pray like other Jews. 
For as soon as Alchonin had taken the children home, he said a hasty evening prayer and went to bed. Sometimes the old woman thought she heard the teacher's helper get up in the middle of the night and go off somewhere. She asked him where he wandered at night, but Alchonin told her that she had been dreaming. The women who sat on benches in the evenings, knitting socks and gossiping, spread the rumour that after midnight Alchonin turned into a werewolf. Some women said he was consorting with a succubus. Otherwise, why should a man remain so many years without a wife? The rich men would not trust their children to him any longer. He now escorted only the children of the poor and seldom ate a spoonful of hot food, but had to content himself with dry crusts. Alchonin became thinner and thinner, but his feet remained as nimble as ever. With his lanky legs, he seemed to stride down the street as though on stilts. He must have suffered constant thirst, for he was always coming down to the well. Sometimes he would merely help a dealer or peasant to water his horse. One day, when Taibele noticed from the distance how his kaftan was torn and ragged, she called him into her shop. He threw a frightened glance and turned white. I see your kaftan is torn said Taibele. If you wish, I will advance you a few yards of cloth. You can, you can pay it off later. Five pennies a week. No. Why not? Taibele asked in astonishment. I won't haul you before the rabbi if you fall behind. You pay when you can. No and he quickly walked out of the store, fearing she might recognise his voice. In summertime, it was easy to visit Taibele in the middle of the night. Alchonen made his way through back lanes, clutching his kaftan around his naked body. In winter, the dressing and undressing in Taibele's cold hallway became increasingly painful. But worst of all were the nights after a fresh snowfall. Alchonen was worried that Taibele or one of the neighbours might notice his tracks. He caught cold and began to cough. One night he got into Taibele's bed with his teeth chattering. He could not warm up for a long time. Afraid that she might discover his hoax, he in invented explanations and, and excuses. But Taibele neither probed nor wished to probe too closely. She had long discovered that a devil had all the habits and frailties of a man. Hormitzer perspired sneezed, hiccuped, yawned. Sometimes his breath smelled of onion, sometimes of garlic. His body felt like the body of her husband, bony and hairy, with an Adam's apple and a navel. At times Hormitzer was in a jocular mood, at other times a sigh broke from him. His feet were not goose feet, but human, with nails and frost blisters. Once, Taibele asked him the meaning of these things, and Hormitzer explained, When one of us consorts with a human female, he assumes the shape of a man. Otherwise, she would die of fright. Yes, Taibele got used to him and loved him. She was no longer terrified of him or his impish antics. 
His tales were inexhaustible, but Tybele often found contradictions in them. Like all liars, he had a short memory. He had told her at first the devils were immortal, but one night he asked, What will you do if I die? But devils don't die. They are taken to the lowest abyss. That winter there was an epidemic in town. Foul winds came from the river, the woods and the swamps. Not only children, but adults as well, were brought down with the ague. It rained and it hailed. Floods broke the dam on the river. The storms blew off an arm of the windmill. On Wednesday night, when Hormitzer came into Tybilla's bed, she noticed that his body was burning hot, but his feet were icy. He shivered and moaned. He tried to entertain her with talk of she-devils, of how they seduced young men, how they convorted with other devils, splashed about in the ritual bath, tied elf locks in old men's beards. But he was weak and unable to possess her. She had never seen him in such a wretched state. Her heart misgave her. She asked, Shall I get you some raspberries with milk? Hormitzer replied, Such remedies are not for our kind. What do you do when you get sick? <sighs> we itch and we scratch. He spoke little after that. When he kissed Taibele, his breath was sour. He always remained with her until cock crow, but this time he left early. Taibere lay silent, listening to his movements in the hallway. He had sworn to her that he flew out of the window even when it was closed and sealed. But she heard the door creak. Tybele knew that it was sinful to pray for devils, that one must curse them and blot them from memory. Yet she prayed to God for Hormitzer. She cried out in anguish. There are so many devils. Let there be one more. On the following Sabbath, Taibele waited in vain for Hormitsa until dawn. He never came. She called him inwardly and muttered the spells he had taught her, but the hallway was silent. Taibele lay benumbed. Hormitsa had once boasted that he had danced for Tubalkain and Henoch, that he had sat on the roof of Noah's ark, licked the salt from the nose of Lot's wife, and plucked the Hashverosh by the beard. He had prophesied that she would be reincarnated after a hundred years as a princess, and that he, Hormitzer, would capture her with the help of his slaves, Chitim and Tachtim, and carry her off to the palace of Boshmas, the wife of Esau. But now he was probably lying somewhere ill, a helpless demon, a lonely orphan, without father or mother, without a faithful wife to care for him. Taibele recalled how his breath came rasping like a sore when he had been with her last. When he blew his nose, there was a whistling in his ear. From Sunday to Wednesday, Taibele went about as one in a dream. On Wednesday, she could hardly wait until the clock struck midnight. But the night went, and Holmitzer did not appear. Taibele turned her face to the wall. The day began 
dark as evening. Fine snow dust was falling from the murky sky. The smoke could not rise from the chimneys. It spread over the roofs like ragged sheets. The rooks cawed harshly, dogs barked. After the miserable night, Kaibele had no strength to go to her store. Nevertheless, she dressed and went outside. She saw four pallbearers carrying a stretcher. From under the snow-swept coverlet protruded the blue feet of a corpse. Only the sexton followed the dead man. Kaibele asked who it was. And the sexton answered, al the teacher's helper. A strange idea came to Taibele to escort al the feckless man who had lived alone and died alone on his last journey. Who would come to the store today? And what did she care for business? Taibele had lost everything. At least she would be doing a, a good deed, a mitzvah. She followed the dead on the long road to the cemetery. There she waited while the gravedigger swept away the snow and dug a grave in the frozen earth. They wrapped al the teacher's helper, in a prayer shawl and a cowl, placed shards on his eyes, and stuck between his fingers a myrtle twig that he would use to dig his way to the Holy Land when the Messiah came. Then the grave was closed, and the gravedigger recited the Kaddish. A cry broke from Taibel. This al had lived a lonely life, just as she did. Like her, he left no heir. Yes, al the teacher's helper, had danced his last dance. From Chormitz's tales, Taibele knew that the deceased did not go straight to heaven. Every sin creates a devil, and these devils are a man's children after his death. They come to demand their share. They call the dead man father and roll him through forest and wilderness until the measure of his punishment is filled and he is ready for purification in hell. From then on, Taibele remained alone, doubly deserted, by an ascetic and by a devil. She aged quickly. Nothing was left to her of the past except a secret that could never be told and would be believed by no one. There are secrets that the heart cannot reveal to the lips. They are carried to the grave. The willows murmur of them. The rooks caw about them. The gravestones converse about them silently in the language of stone. The dead will awaken one day, but their secrets will abide with the Almighty and his judgment until the end of all generations. <laughs>